Okay, first and second Thessalonians, we're, in, uh, we're on lesson number eight in the series. We're in second Thessalonians and uh, open your Bibles to chapter two. That's where we're going to be studying today. So we said that first and second Thessalonians are two letters that Paul wrote to a young church he established in 51 AD. And the key ideas that he writes about, just for, you know, for uh, summary purposes, review purposes, first of all, uh, he writes to them about his joy over the fact that despite their many trials and persecutions, this young church was persevering in faithfulness, in uh, their growth of uh, knowledge of the word of God, brotherly love, and uh, importantly, preparing themselves for the return of Christ. Then the other thing he writes about um, are the events surrounding the return of Jesus. Jesus said He was going to return. The apostles taught that Jesus would return. And there was some confusion about what all of that meant because you know, as we mentioned uh, in the original lessons, this church was established a few weeks, didn't have a lot of time to teach them. So in the first letter he describes what will happen to Christians both living and dead, when Jesus returns, and uh, he exhorts them to be ready for that, uh, for that time. And I'm not going to review all of that, I think we've, we've covered that material pretty well. In the second letter, he explains what's going to happen to sinners and those who are unfaithful when Jesus appears again. Now remember I told you at the end of the world, when Jesus returns, a lot of things happen. A lot of things happen. And they happen in the twinkling of an eye, right? But Paul here in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians doesn't talk about all the things that happen at the end of the world. He just picks certain things. What will happen to Christians living and dead at, when Jesus returns? And now in 2nd Thessalonians, what will happen to sinners and the unfaithful when Jesus returns. And so he encourages them by telling them not to be disheartened by what the wicked are doing. And he tells them when Jesus comes, he will reward the faithful, punish uh, the unfaithful, the wicked, according to their deeds. And after this, he continues in his letter, instructing them concerning the events that will take place now prior to Jesus' return. In the first letter he said, this is, this is what's going to happen when Jesus returns, to the faithful, to the unfaithful, and so on and so forth. Now we're going into, this is what's going to happen, or this is what must happen before Jesus returns. So he kind of backs up now and says, so these are some of the events that are going to take place leading up to the return. Okay? So let's go to chapter two, beginning in uh, verses uh, one and two. He says, now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him. So here he's, you know, he's uh, referring back to what he's already taught to them about what's going to happen when Jesus returns, so on and so forth. Um, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So he's arguing here that the day of the Lord has not come yet. Okay? So if you read between the lines, it seems that there was a, the core problem of this church was that someone may have claimed to have a prophecy. You know, when he says, by the Spirit, that means somebody had a prophecy, or someone claim some sort of authority to, to teach a particular thing, or someone else said, look, we've got a teaching here from one of the apostles that was claiming that the second coming had already happened. This seemed to be the problem here, the, the, the teaching, the false teaching, that's what was confusing everyone. Someone may have promoted the idea that they were already in the midst of it or that it was very, very near. In other words, they were pinpointing. Doesn't that sound familiar? How many times have you heard people say, oh, the end of the world, you know, April 1997. <laughs> and that day comes and goes and nothing happens and they, those prophets have to go back and recalculate 
you know, their, their, their mass. You know. If it was in the Old Testament, that prophet would have been dead by now because they would have stoned him for making a mistake. You know, there was no margin of error for prophecy in the Old Testament. But anyways, I, I digress. So the effect on the church was disturbing. Their composure was being shaken. They were becoming spiritually unbalanced. You know, they were saying, well, if it's already happened, how come I'm still here? What's going on? And if it's very near, what, you know, what, what should we do? They were agitated. They were confused. So Paul begs them not to lose their balance. Remember I talked about bearing, you know, faithfulness, bearing. Don't lose your bearing. Don't lose your balance. And don't become overly disturbed with this teaching and these false notions. Whatever its source, he discounts it. And he reaffirms that before the day of the Lord, before that comes, other significant events must take place first. And then he goes on to give the details about those events that have to take place first. All right. So the, uh, the next passage that we're going to read is probably among the most difficult in the Bible. Even Peter the Apostle attests to the fact that some of Paul's writings were difficult to discern. In 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16 he says, you know, some of Paul's writings are difficult to discern and a lot of people twist those as they do the other scriptures. In addition to the complicated ideas to grasp, this section is written in a literary style which is impossible to understand unless we have some background on the terms. So here's some of the terms that will be used here that we need to kind of get a handle on. He's writing now in what's called apocalyptic style in this passage we're going to read in a minute. This passage uses apocalyptic literary style which is filled with symbolic words and images. The word apocalyptic means an uncovering or a revealing. It was a style of writing used by many in the ancient world, including prophets and other Old Testament writers, to describe in dramatic terms the content of their prophecies. They also used this type of language to warn the nations about impending war or judgment from God. And we have examples of this in the Old Testament. Daniel, for example, when he talks about the dreams that he had, he describes them in apocalyptic language. Or Ezekiel, the visions that he has, same thing, uses apocalyptic language. Joel, which is which is quoted in Acts chapter two. Peter quotes the prophet Joel when he talks about you know, the, the moon, the blood, and you know, all, the moon becoming like, like blood, and, 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 and you know, uh, terrible things happening, stars falling from the sky. You know, that's, that's apocalyptic language. We talked about that when we studied the book of Revelation, right? Uses apocalyptic language. Now, um, they also uh, use this uh, type of language to warn nations, as I, as I mentioned, usually to warn nations. Now the apocalyptic style was mainly used, therefore, in times of trouble or at those periods when the Jews were being oppressed. In many instances, the writing was understandable only to the Jews, but not to others because of the symbols that, meaning, that had meaning only to the Jews. So this apocalyptic style was also used by New Testament writers as well for the very same reasons. Jesus, for example, in Matthew 24, 1 to 34, when he talks about the destruction of Jerusalem, he's using the apocalyptic style. You know, and when he's doing the Proverbs, when he's you know, having a conversation with the Pharisees or his apostles, he's just normal dialogue. But in Matthew 24, he, he reverts to this apocalyptic style to describe the, the end of Jerusalem, you know, the, the, the destruction of the nation of Israel, and then going on to talk about the end of the world. Apocalyptic style. Paul, in 2 Thessalonians, which we're going to read, same thing, reverts to this style of writing. And John, of course, in the book of Revelation, uses this to talk about the destruction of Roman judgment. So the thing we have to remember is it's a literary style used at certain times for certain purposes. All right? Now, the thing to remember about this 
is that when this style is used, it's a coded message to the reader. Now it may be disturbing to read, but it was actually meant to comfort and encourage God's people in times of trouble. So you read Revelation, you wow, the dragons and stuff, you know, monsters, you know, it's kind of scary. But if you understood the symbols, you realize that he was encouraging the church you know, to, to, to be steadfast, to hang in there, to be faithful, because the, the enemy, the evil one, the dragon, all that, that would be destroyed eventually. Okay, so the purpose is warning, usually in a coded message, usually at times of trouble, many times used actually as an encouragement. So this language uh, is the language that Paul switches to in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 to 8. We can't understand his message unless we understand the symbolism that the message is wrapped up in. So let's read the passage. He says, now remember what we're talking about. Some people are saying the end has already come, or you're in the middle of it, or it's very, very near. So he switches to talk about the end. He says, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. So you read that and you go, huh? <laughs> I understand the individual words, but when I put all those words together, I go, huh? What's that about? What's he talking about? So before we search for the overall meaning, let's look at some of the, the key terms, okay? First term that he uses, Apostasy, verse three. Apostasy literally means, look, look at my hands. Apostasy literally means to fall away, okay? To fall away from, from something. In this case, it means here's Christ and His teachings, and here are the Christians. Apostasy is Christians falling away from Christ and His teaching. That's what apostasy means in this context. Now remember something very important. Apostasy in the New Testament refers only to the Christian faith. Muslims, for example, who read this passage, let's say, they cannot be apostate because they are never in the faith to begin with. You, know, you have to be a Christian in order to be guilty of apostasy because apostasy is falling away from Christ and His teachings, okay? So for non-believers, uh, the term can be pagans or the lost. You know, if you're referring to people who are not Christians, you can refer to them as pagans or the lost or unbelievers, you, know, you can refer to them as that. For Christians who go away from Christ or His teaching, the correct term is to be apostate or to be in apostasy. You can't call a Christian a pagan. You can't call a Christian an unbeliever. You, know, you can call him or her apostate because they've fallen away from Christ for whatever reason and in whatever manner. The second word is man of, or expression, man of lawlessness. Some of your Bibles have son of perdition, some Bibles have son of destruction. It's kind of translated different ways. Lawlessness means sinfulness or sin. Man of sinfulness or man of sin. The, so what he's talking about when he uses this is the sin that accompanies the apostasy. There's the apostasy, the falling away, and then there's the sin accompanying that falling away. It is a one of a kind, unique personality or power or organization that embodies this sin. So the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, the son of perdition, the antichrist, 
all refer to the same thing. Remember I've told you perhaps in other series, other classes, that the Bible, in the Bible, the writers often refer to one thing with many terms. And we get confused trying to give different meanings to all the different, they all refer to the same thing. Another term used, restraining influence in verse six. So the person or the power that restrains the man of lawlessness, whatever form the man of lawlessness takes, a person, an idea, a group, a whatever it is, okay, whatever that is, there's something that restrains it from declaring its position and revealing itself for what it is or what he is. So you have the, you have the man of lawlessness, and we, we, we haven't figured out yet what that is, a person, a corporation, an idea, a movement, a philosophy, you know, whatever that man of lawlessness is, there's that. And then there's the restraining power that holds that power back from fully engaging and fully expressing itself. Okay, we got that? Then there's the mystery of lawlessness in verse seven. This refers to the actual outworking of evil generated by the apostasy. So you have the apostasy, right? You have Christ, His teachings, you have the apostasy. As the apostasy happens, okay, it creates turbulence, it creates activity, it creates results. Just like faith creates, right? Faith and fidelity, it creates something, doesn't it? It creates the growth of the kingdom of God. It creates stronger Christians. It, it creates more and more people that come to faith and so on and so forth. Well, in the same way, the apostasy, the falling away, it also creates something. It also stirs up things. And, 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 and the, uh, Paul refers to that activity as the mystery of lawlessness. Just like the outworking of good caused by the word of God in building up the kingdom, the apostasy also spreads its influence, but in a, a negative way. Jesus used to refer to it, this thing, as the leaven, right? Beware the leaven of the Pharisees. You know, the outworking of their evil and their hypocrisy. The breath of his mouth, probably the easiest one, the breath of his mouth is the word of God. You know, in the book of Revelation, the scriptures, you know, it says he comes a sword, you know, Jesus comes a sword in his mouth. You know, well, we know what that refers to, the word of God, that's the sword, right? The breath of his mouth. The appearance of his coming in verse eight, that is referring to the coming of Jesus, the second coming. And then prophecy. Paul is prophesying, uh, prophesizing here based on the revelation from God given to him. So he's operating very much like an Old Testament prophet who spoke about things that would happen in the future. Well, Paul you know, has also that gift, right? Paul had the gift of tongues, remember? He said, uh, you know, I, I speak in tongues more than any of you, he says, but I'd rather you know, say something, you know, three words that people could understand than 10,000 words that people couldn't understand, right? I'm paraphrasing here, of course. So he was a multi-gifted individual from a spiritual perspective. Here he's demonstrating his ability to prophesy. So he is telling them what will happen in the future and at the end of time. This is the same thing as when he described what will happen to the faithful and the wicked at the end. So he has prophecy, he tells them, this is what's going to happen to you, faithful people, and those who died faithfully. This is what's going to happen to you when Jesus returns. Now he backs up and he says, all right, this is what's going to happen before Jesus returns. Both are prophecies. One thing to note carefully, however, one thing to note carefully is the order, in order to avoid confusion. Important idea here, important biblical interpretation you know, idea. Prophecy gives the facts of what will happen in succession of events, but it rarely gives the time Rarely does it give the time, or rarely does it give the amount of time in between the events. 
Now, an exception to this was Jeremiah, right? He said 70 years, you're going to be in captivity for 70 years. He gave the exact number, and sure enough, after 70 years, they started coming back. That's the exception. So we know, let me just change this here. So we know what is going to take place, and we know the order of things, but we're never told when they will happen or how much time elapses between the events or when all the events will be completed. So that's, that's a rule of thumb for prophecy when you're trying to interpret it. Perfect example of this, okay? Remember John the Baptist? <clears throat> John the Baptist prophesied the coming of the Messiah as well as the judgment of the Jewish nation in Matthew chapter 3, 11 and 12. Right? He was saying, you know, the, the kingdom, kingdom of heaven is, is at hand. You know, the king, it's coming. You better be ready. You know, the ax is going to be laid to the root. You know, he's, so he's prophesying the coming of the kingdom and the judgment to come on the nation of Israel. Now, in John the Baptist's mind, these two events were to take place at the same time. Yeah, Messiah would come, judgment would happen. Boom, right away. So when he is put in prison by Herod, do you remember in uh, Matthew 11, he sends his disciples to Jesus to inquire if Jesus was truly the Messiah? Do you ever wonder why he asked that? Well, he was confused because Jesus the Messiah was here. He was convinced that Jesus was the Messiah, the miracles, the, the dove, you know, appearing when he was baptized, all of that stuff, all the signs were there. But there was something missing. There was no sign of the judgment on the nation. So he's saying, well, wait a minute here. And the Messiah comes, the judgment happens. There's no judgment. You know, the, 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 the leaders are chasing Jesus around there. They're trying to kill him. He, he knew what was going on. Where's the judgment? So he sends his disciples to Jesus saying, hey, you know, it's like, hey, what's going on? <laughs> Where's the judgment? Are you really the Messiah? Well, we know from hindsight what happens, right? 37 years after Jesus' death and res uh, resurrection, and some 40 years after John's death at the hands of Herod, what happens? God's judgment on Israel, on the nation, takes place. Exactly what John said was going to happen. There was going to be a judgment. It just happened 40 years you know, after he predicted it or prophesied. So in 70 AD, the nation of Israel comes to an end as the Roman army destroys the city and kills most of its people. John's prophecy is fulfilled. The judgment is there. So John had the events and he had the sequence. It wasn't the judgment and then the Messiah comes. He had the right sequence. The Messiah comes, then the judgment. What he didn't have was the time frame. He didn't know how much time between the coming of the Messiah and the judgment. Okay, so let's go back to our passage. In the passage in 2 Thessalonians, we see Paul predicting events that will happen in the future, and he explains the sequence of these events, but not their time frame. So it could have all happened during their lifetimes. Yeah, it could have in the first century, or it could take 10,000 years to fulfill. We don't know. What we do know is that it will happen in the sequence that it has been spoken of, but only God knows when. So when we study this passage, we're studying the meaning and the sequence of what will take place, but we have no idea of the time frame. So anytime you want to discern somebody you know, just shooting off their mouth or just making, you know, thinking they're a prophet. The minute, they, the minute that they assign a time frame, this is where you change the channel, okay? Okay, you go back to OSU football if you're interested. You know what I'm saying? Sorry. So now, the sequence of events. Paul explains two major events that must take place before this third event, the return of Christ. He explains this in order to calm their fears in thinking that the return of Christ has already happened and they missed it somehow. 
or that it was going to happen very, very soon. Um, believe it or not, a similar idea took place in, in our own church, our own brotherhood, oh, maybe 10, 15 years ago. Anybody hear of the 70 AD theory? Anybody familiar with that? See? But at the time, the 70 AD theory was raging in our brotherhood and it was going back and forth. You know, the idea that it, it had happened already. And there were articles being written in you know, brotherhood papers and stuff, you know, people purporting the idea that it's all happened, you know, we're living in, the, and, 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 and just for those who are watching this on the, on, on, online or on DVD, not one hand went up in our class thinking, you know, remembering 70 AD, right. It came and it went. Because why? Because it tried to give the time, okay? It tried to give the time, assign the time to something that the Bible doesn't assign the time. All right, so let's, uh, let's talk about the, um, the passage. In verse 3a, he says, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. So the return of Jesus does not happen until this takes place a rebellion, a falling away from faith in Christ and obedience to His word. This is an event that takes place within Christianity, not in the world, within Christianity. Let's read uh, Acts, oh there it is, sorry. Let's read Acts uh, chapter 20, shall we? I'll read it for you. It says, I know that after my departure, savage, this is Paul, by the way, speaking to elders in the church. He says, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things, watch it, to draw away the disciples after them. To draw away the disciples. So Paul is saying, be careful. After I'm gone, he says, the, the apostasy, you know, the attempt at apostasy will begin to happen. And then in 2 Timothy, Chapter four, verses three and four, again, Paul talks about this issue. He says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. So Paul mentions that this apostasy, this, this falling away was inevitable and it was likely within his own lifetime. So apostasy is the action of leaving the truth and embracing a lie. It is the love of what is not true and the ultimate cause of condemnation. So we know that that's one of the things that has to happen before Jesus returns and we also know that it's already happened. It's already taking place. So the apostasy began in the first century as teachers rose up to deny the divinity of Christ and it continues to this day as many, quote, Christian groups deny the inspiration of the scriptures or they teach that Christ is an angel, like the Jehovah Witnesses, or uh, they teach that uh, Christ is a man who eventually became God, like the, like the Mormons teach. Well, that's, that's apostasy, that's not what the Bible teach. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and then the Word became flesh. Where do you see in that, that that Jesus was at some point a man? I mean, started as a man. No, he was always God. And then he became a man. Exactly the reverse teaching. Okay? So we know that the apostasy has already begun and is flourishing. So in verse, uh, let's go back to 2 Thessalonians here. He talks about the man of lawlessness will be revealed. So the big question is, what is he like? What is the man of lawlessness like? Well, first of all, in verse three, it says, a one-of-a-kind person or personage. Uh, it could be uh, embodied in a personality or an organization or a philosophy or a movement. There was a time in Second World War, people thought Hitler was the man of lawlessness. I mean, he didn't fit all the categories, but certainly, made himself equal with God, so on and so forth. You know. Paul says that the man of lawlessness is hidden at first and then revealed. 
Another thing it says about him is that the man of lawlessness opposes every god. Every object of worship is opposed. The man of lawlessness, according to Paul, this character, you know, again, does not deny that there is a God, but opposes every form of deity. It's a big difference. So the man of lawlessness is not an atheist. Man of lawlessness, he says, recognizes there's a God, but is opposed to God. Wants to take God's place within God's sanctuary or God's dwelling place. Places himself where God is and and makes himself equal with God. And he makes himself, remember now, equal with God, and this is happening within Christianity, not out in the world, not among unbelievers or other religions. This is happening within Christianity, take note. So God's sanctuary on earth is within the heart and mind of His people. And so the man of lawlessness is someone, some thing, some movement, some philosophy, whatever, some entity that tries to take the place of God within the heart of the Christian. And then in verses five to seven, he says uh, his influence is manifested before he is. Hmm, what does that mean? What is that all about? Th like, let me give you an example, okay? Um, you put something in a seed in the ground, right? And the first thing that develop are roots and then a stalk and then the leaves. All that happens before there's the actual bloom. And if you don't know a lot about plants, you know, like, like I do, they all look, look the same to me, you, know, you wouldn't be able to know what kind of flower or fruit is coming up just by looking at the leaves or the branches or whatever. So in the same way, the man of lawlessness you know, will manifest itself before the bloom comes, before, before people say, oh, all this stuff, oh, this is the man of lawlessness over here, or the son of destruction or the antichrist. So now Paul says that his influence is and was being restrained at the time that Paul wrote his letters to the Thessalonians. It had not bloomed yet, but was already at work in its evil influence. This manifestation, he says, was being restrained by a person or a power or a combination of both, which will uh, later be removed. So let me skip verse eight for now, and let's talk about what will the man of lawlessness do? It says, that is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they may all be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. So he says, he will deceive people in the name of God and Christ in order to seduce them to believe what is false and be lost because of it. Dangerous individual, huh? And he will do this thing, listen, he will do this thing using all manner of false power, false signs, false wonders, wicked lies, and deceptions. In other words, the man of lawlessness, the gloves are off. The gloves are off. It's an all-out effort to destroy Christianity. An all-out effort. Nothing, everything's on the table, okay? These powerful weapons are necessary to convince people that the lie is true. He will know that he is a liar, he will lie on purpose, he will do so in order to destroy the souls of men, verse 10. The sad thing is that Paul tells us in advance why Christians will believe these lies. They don't love the truth. They love sin, they love the world, they love self, but they don't love the truth. And then he says, God gives them what they desire, lies, by allowing the man of lawlessness to work his works so that those among the believers who love lies, they'll get their fill. 
The, quote, diluting influence is the cumulative effect produced by believing error and lies. You, you understand what I'm saying? Do you ever try to teach someone who has been taught from an early age something completely different than the scriptures? Even if you open the scriptures and you show them black and white exactly what it says, not very complicated passages, you know, just this is what it says. You know? I mean, the amount of false teaching that they have overwhelms their ability to just look and objectively see that what they have been taught is incorrect. So, you know, God doesn't send lies or errors, but He does permit and direct where Satan may work. For example, you know, Satan wanted to destroy Job, but you know, God said, well, you can do this and that, but you, you, know, you can't kill him. God still controls that. So people who love wickedness eventually refuse to listen or accept truth, and they will have ample time to demonstrate their evil error so as to also demonstrate how just God is in condemning them. In other words, God says, hey, you like this stuff? You want to eat on, you want to feed on these lies and this all? Go ahead, fill her up, fill her up. So there'll be no, absolutely no excuse at the end when you're judged, because you got your fill. I let you just fill yourself up with this stuff. So what will happen to him? What will happen to him, now we'll go back to verse eight, because it's, it, flows a little better this way. He says, then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. So God will destroy him in two steps. The breath of his mouth is the word of truth, the word of God, and the appearance of his son, the return of Christ for the judgment. So remember, remember that all of these events will take place, but we don't know when or if they will take place at all once or spread over a period of time. In other words, the apostasy isn't just for the first century, the apostasy has been going on since then. I mean, you know, just name all the people who in the name of Christ have done things that absolutely are against or you know, not even found in the scriptures. We know that. The man of lawlessness, we know he hasn't been revealed. You know why we know he hasn't been revealed? because we don't know who He is, and it says right here that He'll be revealed. Well, He'll be revealed to who? Well, He'll be revealed to us. We'll know. The world won't know. Revelation doesn't go to unbelievers. Revelation goes to believers. We'll know, and we don't know. But, but, right, the activity of lawlessness, right, the manifestation of evil, oh, is that in the world? Oh man, is it ever. Do we see it? Absolutely. So let me just summarize and that'll be the lesson for now. So Paul tells the Thessalonian church that the day of the Lord has not come, so they shouldn't be worried or upset by anyone who brings a teaching to this, uh, to the contrary. He tells them that before the Lord returns, two important things must happen. First, the apostasy must occur and had already begun in some respects. And secondly, the man of lawlessness had to be revealed for who he is. It's not enough that the man of lawlessness is creating evil in the world and trouble in the world. He had to be revealed for who he is. All right, so in our next lesson, we're going to try to see who the man of lawlessness um, is, how he works today, what the restraining power might be. There are four possibilities, by the way. In the meantime, three very practical lessons and then we're done for today. First lesson, bad teaching hurts the church. We need to be careful not only of how we live, but also what we teach. The only way to stay with Christ's teaching and make corrections when there is error. Bad teaching, careless teaching, teaching of worldly ideas instead of Bible concepts often divides the church slows its growth. So you know, people say, oh, it doesn't matter. Doctrine's not a matter unless, uh, unless we just have to love each other. And yes, we do have to love each other. And by the way, loving each other, that's a doctrine. <laughs> it's an important doctrine, but it's not the only doctrine. Secondly, Satan des desires to destroy our souls. So when we pray, God, please help us and protect us, we're not, we're not just whistling in the dark. You know. That's a very real prayer for a very real a reason. And number three, we can be the true church. 
The right and true religion and the church that practices is the one that carefully and humbly follows Christ's teaching. Don't be fooled by appearances and signs and flashiness. The word of God is our only sure sign of what is right and good. All right, that's it for this week. Thank you very much.